Highlights from the Shelley Palmer Innovation Series Summit at CES 2020. Working together to understand AI bias. Now, a lot of people talk about bias in the context of somebody couldn't get a mortgage because of where they live or what they look like and the computer doesn't know or someone couldn't get a job and all of that bias is real. I'm here to tell you it is your responsibility, you individually, every single person in this room, to understand the concept of AI bias, not <clears throat> the way it's written about in the newspaper or the way it's sensationalized, but the actual way that it is. I have written chapter and verse about it at ShellyPalmer.com. There are many people who have written about it. It is probably the singularly biggest issue we are all facing because no one understands AI. And anyone who tells you they understand how a neural network works once it starts to learn is lying to you. You can't blame a black box if the black box says don't hire this person or evaluates a teacher a certain way and you as an executive say, well, this is what the computer told me to do. I'm sorry, that's unacceptable. AI bias is the most important issue we are ever, ever going to deal with ever as executives because it's hidden from us. The largest AI project on planet Earth is Google Translate. And this is a model that has evolved from a statistical machine learning model a few years ago to a neural network. And the improvements have been unbelievable. So I didn't want to get into politics, and I didn't want to get into race relations, and I didn't want to get into all the crazy with respect to the emotional issues of how to deal with AI bias. What I want to do for you today is I want to bring out Barack Tarofsky, who is a product lead at Google Artificial Intelligence, and he's in charge of the largest AI project in the world. And I'd like, and Barack is gonna take a couple seconds and he's gonna show you what it is that we are up against. Let me say this very clearly. A three-year-old knows that people go in cars and cars go on streets, right? Because it's human. Shelley drove down the street in his car. Unquestionably, I am driving the car, the car is on the street. You're a computer. Shelley drove down the street in his car. The preposition is ambiguous. Shelley drove down the street that's in his car, or Shelley drove down the street in his car. It's called prepositional phrase attachment ambiguity, and a three-year-old knows that that's not a problem. You all know it's not a problem. Computers are not human, folks. Computers are not human. They don't have context. They learn, and we have to teach them. Computer music, real music, something else. Please welcome Barack Tarofsky, product leader, AI, Google. Hi, everyone, and thanks for coming to this wonderful event. Uh, my good friend Shelley asked me to talk about one of his favorite topics, the responsibilities of big tech companies towards users and society at large. So I wanted to talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning, which is one of the hottest topics out there, and the biases that sometimes happen in AI and machine learning models, and what Google, as a, a leader on artificial intelligence, is doing to address this bias is using one of the products that I'm responsible for, Google Translate. I'm generally responsible for natural, natural language understanding products, uh, product team at Google, uh, are doing to address those biases. So first of all, let's start with some context about Google Translate, and frankly, why do we need translations? And the answer is pretty simple. Uh, roughly 50% of the content on the internet is in English. English is de facto the language of the internet. However, only 20% of world population have any English skills, including basic English skills. And generally, 80% of the content on the internet are only in 10 languages. We have hundreds of languages in the world. Therefore, a lot of people, especially people in emerging markets that overcome the infrastructure barrier of the internet, 
thanks to mobile phones and Android, they come to the internet, but they don't know the language of the internet. Therefore, internet is not a very friendly place for them. That's why Google invests so much, so many efforts and so many resources into Google Translate. And that's why Google Translate is such, such a huge and beloved product. By the way, show of hands, how many of you used Google Translate? Wow. Thanks for being one of the more than one billion user base. So just a couple of stats. We translate 140 billion words every single day. It's mind-boggling even in Google standards. We have more than one billion active users. Not surprisingly, 95% of our users are coming from outside of the United States. Again, not surprisingly, more than 50% of our users are using it on mobile. And we have more than 800 million mobile app downloads. And one of the reasons we have a lot of mobile app downloads is that we evolved beyond just tech translations. We're doing a lot of stuff using your camera. For example, a feature called WordLens that uses the power of machine learning and augmented reality to very quickly, faster than you blink, when you point the camera to a text, let's say a sign on a menu, it recognizes the text, translates the text on device. You don't need internet for that. And uses augmented reality to overlay the translation over so it will look like it's in context. Another thing we are doing, we're using power of speech. We help people overcome language barriers, not only through reading or writing, but also through speaking. You might have heard about pixel buds and translation feature that uh, is available there. Now, another thing that I consider myself to be extremely lucky that my team is on the forefront of machine learning research. Uh, if you have not read it, I highly encourage you to read a really excellent piece from Europe Magazine from 2016 when Google Translate released their what's called neural machine translations. It talks about the history of AI from the 40s, from Turing tests. And as every disruptive technology, it went through ups and downs, what is called AI winter. And in 2016, there was a breakthrough that showed that neural, deep neural networks, what we call AI, are possible at large scale. And it's a really excellent article about how Google Translate, to some extent, gave, was the first product that gave rebirth to what we now call AI. Now, as leaders in artificial intelligence, we believe that we have responsibility to address biases in machine learning. There is a lot of coverage in the press and elsewhere about different biases, race biases, gender biases. Many products are affected by it, and Google Translate is affected by it as well. The, the reason is that Google Translate used Crawl the Web to find content that was already translated by humans. And this content goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years, actually thousands of years. One of the biggest sources of our translations in many languages is Bible. And you have deeply inherited societal bias in those translations. For example, doctors as a profession was male, exclusively male, for thousands of years. And nanny was exclusively or predominantly female for thousands of years. Therefore, if you have a language that is language neutral or language ambiguous, for example, Turkish, you will get translations of she's a nurse, he's a doctor. She's a nanny, he's an engineer. Now, we could say, and even my good friend Shelley, who usually gives me a hard time, agreed that the bias is deeply ingrained, and it's a human bias that happens, goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. So therefore, Shelley said, yes, it's a deeply ingrained bias. We cannot blame Google, or only Google, for that. So he gave me easier time. But we believe that as leaders in artificial intelligence, we have a responsibility to society to deal with it. Google, that's why we developed and published our AI principles. And one of the important principles is that we will not create, and most importantly, we will not reinforce existing unfair biases. That's why we invest significant resources trying to address 
biases, starting with gender bias in Google Translate. And I wanted to talk, explain to you a bit about that. Now, the first question, it sounds very easy. It's probably a task for, I don't know, third grader. But the first question is, what do you do when you have ambi ambiguous gender? How do you resolve it? The first approach, that is what we, that what we did before, was just let the training data, data vote. If you have training data that shows 90% of the time doctor is male, just show male. That doesn't really address the issue. We can take a bit more randomized approach and just quote unquote flip the coin. Sounds a bit random, right? We could also try to adopt some gender neutral novelties. Some, some countries have language academies and they start to address this issue. They start to develop gender neutral, uh, gender -neutral uh, approaches. The problem with that is that A, it's very new and languages tend to evolve very slowly. Therefore, when people have a need, it doesn't really address their need. Plus, we need to remember there is not only female and, female and male definition of gender, and that's another area where Google is trying to address. So what we decide to do is to effectively, if possible, to change the task. What it means is that when people make a query and ask for translation, they expect one result. If there is ambiguity on gender, we'll give them two results and we'll explain why we're giving them two results. For example, on the right, you see a phrase in Turkish, Obir doctor, which is ambiguous. You don't know the gender. Instead of saying he's a doctor, reinforcing unfair bias, we will show both. She's a doctor and he's a doctor, and we'll explain which one is which and why we are showing it. Sounds pretty easy. As I said, maybe a task for a third grader, but it's actually very hard for machines. And the reason is machines has no notion or knowledge of gender at all. Therefore, we had to develop not one, but three machine learning models, machine learning systems to address this. The first one is to detect those gender neutral or gender ambiguous queries. The second one, generate gender specific translations, so you can show both of them. And third one is check for accuracy and actually filter out things that do not make sense. So let's expand a bit on that. So first, as I mentioned, detect gender ambiguous queries. For a child, for a human, sounds very simple task, but, but machines don't have a notion of gender. So first, you need to understand those gender-specific rules, and it's language by language. Then, you, using those rules, you need to extract positive and negative training examples so you can train your models. Positive example is from him, from her, for example. Negative example is like at 10, it's completely unrelated to gender. You need to extract all those and start training the models. And then you basically train what we call a text classifier using machine learning. The second task is to generate male and female translations. So you extract, again, as I mentioned, in the data, machines don't know. Machine learning systems do not know what gender means. They don't know which data is gen gender, which data is male, which data is female. So you need to extract this, human label it, and then start taking and training the data to explain this is male data, he's a doctor is male, and she's a doctor is female. And then, very important, you need to also find the optimal training process. In machine learning, it's always a trade-off between the size of the machine learning model and the performance you'll get. Also, please remember the translation task is not only about gender. There is a lot of things you need to do to, to create proper translation. So this optimal weight of training performance versus size, how you overweight or underweight the, the, the gender system is extremely important for overall performance of the system. And the last one is frankly my favorite, is how do you check the translations are valid and actually make sense? And let me show you an example. When you create a gender variance, you want to make sure the translation meaning sometimes is not changed. For example, he wants to make everything his own, she wants to make everything her own, makes sense, is gender consistent, you should keep it. But in some cases, the meaning of some words around gender is also changed due to intricacies of the training data. For example, did he really say this word when you create a gender translation in female? It, it changes not only did she, she changes it to did she actually say those words. Sometimes it changes the meaning. 
And I will show you some even more extreme example. It's, it's, it was actually most fascinating, but the most difficult task to actually filter what we call incorrect results. And the reason is that we sh you should never underestimate the power of machine learning system that is narrowly focused on a very specific task. In this particular case, it was very good in producing male and female translations, even when those do not make sense. So a couple of examples. In this example, correct translation is, will you marry me? The task is gender translation. The computers created, will you marry her? Will you marry him? Another one is, did you come home? Has nothing to do with gender. If you get a task, did you come home to her? Did you come home to him? And my personal favorite, value added tax. <laughs> if, you got a, if you got a task, machine translation is very good in producing those, so it will say her value added tax, his value added tax. So we had to work extremely hard to filter out translations that achieve the primary task of creating gender variance, but they actually sometimes completely distort the meaning of the translation. So that's our story, and thank you so much for listening. For more information, please visit ShellyPalmer.com.